Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Tim Ogden. I'm the Managing Director of the Financial Access Initiative at NYU Wagner. And I'm joined today by Jonathan Mordock, the Founder and Executive Director of FAI, to talk about financial inclusion and the financial needs of small firms and how we can better understand those. So I want to give you first uh, a quick overview of what we're going to be doing and of the Small Firm Diary study that we'll be talking about mostly. Um, but this session, uh, we figure that uh, everybody's had plenty of uh, webinars and Zoom meetings. And so rather than have this highly structured, uh, that we would try just having a conversation. So Jonathan and I have prepared some notes and talked about what we're going to talk about, but uh, this isn't scripted and there isn't a whole lot of uh, next slide and this slide, and now you're going to see these sorts of things. We are going to be presenting some early data from the diaries as we go. Now, uh, also, because this is a conversation, we'd be, love to um, enter into conversation with you. So if you do have questions in the, the swap card uh, uh, text, you can uh, add some questions and we'll be able to see those as they go so that we can bring those into the conversation. So at any point, if there's something uh, you disagree with that you'd like to hear more about, that you'd li uh, like to weigh in on, please do so. Now, with that, let me get into a little bit more of what it is that we're doing. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are part of finan the Financial Access Initiative at NYU Wagner, which is a research center focused on how financial services can better meet the needs and improve the lives of poor households around the world. And that includes those that are touched by small firms. The Small Firm Diaries is a major research project that we started a year and a half ago. Uh, you know, all the preparatory work that is going to be studying small firms in seven countries uh, around the world. You see those on the map, Colombia, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, Indonesia, and Fiji. That work has been funded by the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Argidius Foundation, uh, FSD Kenya, <clears throat> uh, UNISCAP, and the Australian National University to give us this global coverage, which uh, you know allows us, we hope, to see what's in common with small firms in these countries, but also differences regionally and nationally uh, that help to answer some of the core questions that we have about what's going on. And the approach here is to follow 100 to 150 firms in each of these countries for 12 months, visiting them weekly so that we can get that high frequency cash flow data. And as I mentioned, you know, financial, the Financial Access Initiative is all about how uh, financial services affect low-income households. And so, of course, uh, a generic definition of small firm can include just a lot of firms. Uh, we are focused particularly on firms in uh, low-income areas, low-income neighborhoods, low-income parts of these countries, where we believe that the owners and or the employees and customers uh, would fit our definitions of low income so that we can better understand how uh, these small firms play a role in the, these economies. We're particularly interested in uh, firms owned by women. There are a lot of questions about how uh, gender affects the profitability, the prospects, the ability to invest, even the aspirations of firm owners and what that then means for employees uh, and their communities. We're very interested in how digital financial services are potentially transforming uh, the economic lives of these small firms. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we come from uh, an economics perspective. And so we care a lot about growth, that uh, growth is what yields uh, escape from poverty uh, by and large, that we need these firms to uh, grow in productivity so that they can hire more workers and pay those workers better wages so that everyone, uh, so that growth is inclusive and, and, and raises the floor, more, brings more households out of poverty. So if you're not aware of Financial Diaries, just quickly, uh, this is similar to what we've done with households uh, around the world and other organizations have picked up on the Financial Diaries methodology in various ways. And so they're really fascinating studies of smallholder farmers, of corner shops, uh, of uh, garment workers, of uh, rural Bangladeshi households. Uh, we uh, did a study of low-income households in the United States. Um, and so now that the diaries methodology of households is fairly well understood, we wanted to apply that methodology to firms by doing basically the exact same thing, recruiting some emblematic firms, visiting them weekly, gathering high frequency cash flows from them, but not just the quantitative side. The real power of diaries is the ability to marry qualitative 
understanding with those cash flows. So you do not just see the spending and the saving and the borrowing um, and the income, but you get to ask questions about why, and especially about why not, because you can see the moments where there are decisions and you can, uh, you built up this trust from visiting these, uh, these participants so often that you can ask very detailed questions about the decisions they're making and why they're making them and what the barriers and challenges that they face are. Now, uh, before we move on, just quickly, because I did say something about small firms, and this is a, a, a piece of language that's, that's pretty difficult to deal with because uh, we have microenterprise, and, and uh, Jonathan and I come very much from the microfinance and microenterprise perspective, uh, which in that realm is typically defined as these zero employee uh, businesses. Um, in a lot of the world, though, uh, micro means zero to 10 employees. Um, small sometimes means zero and sometimes means 50 employees. Medium uh, is even less defined. And so you see the phrase micro businesses, uh, small and medium enterprises, micro, small and medium enterprises. And they mean the very different things to very for different people in different parts of the world. So we use the phrase small firms so as to not have to use SME or MSME um, and define that very, very narrowly or specifically as firms with one to 20 non-family employees. That is because that distinguishes them from the micro, which we have a lot of research on understanding micro enterprises, but it also distinguishes them from firms that have grown enough to have professional management. And we believe based on the literature that that's a really, really important break. Uh, the management of a firm has a, a lot to do with what their needs are and their, their possibilities for growth are. And that when a firm has gotten to the size of hiring professional managers, it's in a different category than these firms that are at the cusp. And so we are focused on these firms of one to 20 non-family employees. Um, they're not exclusively formal. Some of them are informal. Um, and some of them are sort of graduates from microfinance. Some of them have relationships with larger banks. Uh, but we think this is a real big hole in the literature. And that's why we decided to focus uh, here. So that's uh, the background of what we've got. Uh, Jonathan, I th see, is now on camera. Uh, Jonathan, um, uh, I, I would say it's a pleasure to talk to you, but of course we get to have these conversations on a fairly regular basis. Um, welcome. Hey, Tim. Yeah, no, this is nice. It's nice to have a conversation in public and hopefully there'll be questions and um, people prodding us to think harder, or push in different ways about these topics. You know, one of the things which I really like um, about this setup is that when we talk about small firms, we're not selecting or cherry picking particular firms. So we're interested in firms that are not growing. We're interested in firms that may be growing fast. We're somewhere in between. That is really the, the focus. Why are firms having such a big diversity of experience? And can we learn by listening uh, more carefully? You know, it's been a long haul now. We have some great partners. We have some great funders. Lyft, MFO have been really um, integral to this, this work in terms of implementing um, this vision. And it's a complicated vision. Sometimes it feels like this is just impossible. You know, to spend so much time getting so much information on a population that um, hasn't been studied with this kind of fine-grained detail. But it takes me back to the beginning, you know? Like, and I, I want to start this by asking you what was it that for you suggested we should go down this path? Do you remember that moment? Um, yeah, so I will say, I, I remember a long time ago, a conversation with a friend who pointed out that uh, the only reason the human uh, beings survive is that we forget how incredibly painful the process of uh, having a baby and raising an infant is, is that we, if we actually remember this, no one would ever have a second child. Uh, and in some ways I feel like this in the small firm diaries is after getting through the U S financial diaries, like what was I thinking doing this again? Um, but it was actually in the U S financial diaries that I remember very specifically this moment uh, on a street in Queens. Uh, one of our, our groups of households was in Queens. And you're in this, these neighborhoods visiting these households and you see these businesses on these corners. And I just couldn't get over like, how do these businesses work? The, the cost of the real estate, the access to employees, the access to finance, the, you know, serving these kinds of neighborhoods that 
know, there isn't necessarily a lot of big spending. Um, and, you know, these are not uh, franchises of much bigger networks. These are lots of independently owned firms. And so I remember standing there thinking, I really want to understand how these firms work, where the money comes from. And so, uh, you know, with that as, as, as a bit of it, at the same time, we were seeing a lot of the impact evaluation results from microcredit, um, where not just the question of, you know, these firms, the vast majority of microenterprises are not growing. They're not sort of fulfilling that idea, that hope. Um, but there is this sort of segment of them that that are. So the, uh, the, the language of gung-ho entrepreneurs and reluctant entrepreneurs has been used uh, pretty commonly. Um, but... What I saw in reaction to a lot of that was then a, this sort of stream, this stream of research towards, well, if we can just target microfinance better to the gung-ho entrepreneurs, then we'll be able to fulfill the promise of microfinance. But the problem I had with that was that as best we could tell, the firms that were bigger, the ones that had grown, don't keep growing. And so even if we targeted microfinance to the gung-ho entrepreneurs and they grow to one or two employees, well, that's, I mean, that's good. There's nothing bad about that, but it doesn't mean they're going to keep growing that we've really solved the problem. They're just going to run into something, some unidentified challenge or barrier that we didn't have. And, you know, I saw in the diaries sort of the ability to, to really understand what was happening in those firms that are, there's a, there's a lot to understand. And so somehow I overcame the fear of, uh, of this and along the way, other people agreed. And so we kept on adding countries and, um, ideas till we got to this, uh, what seems often overwhelming now, seven countries uh, running this study. Now, that's that's my story. Of course, I had to convince you um, that it was worth doing as well. So what do you find particularly interesting about this, having spent the last 20 years thinking about microfinance? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, one of the things about microfinance um, in relation to the household diaries, the financial diaries, was seeing that with microfinance, if you look at the sector through the lens of organizations, if you look at it through the lens of profit statements, if you look at it through the traditional way that we think about microfinance, you're gonna miss a lot of what's going on. And the financial diaries by following households, right? not organizations, but households, and some of them not using microfinance, some using microfinance, you get a really different view of what microfinance does and doesn't do. And so it didn't take a lot of selling to convince me that diaries were really useful here. Trying to figure out, you know, who the diary should be of and how, you know, it was a much bigger question. But I, you know, have really come to see the power of diaries together with RCTs, together with other um, kinds of approaches. Um, it's really useful to listen and step back. And that was a key thing. Like you said, you know, the results on microfinance have been mixed and maybe that's that's charitable in terms of impacts. And yet people are using microfinance in lots of ways which are helpful that we may not be picking up so well in the impact studies. I think one of the questions, you know, that had come up originally and you alluded to this is, well, maybe microfinance is just too small right? and maybe we should throw our weight or as a funder or as a policymaker throw weight onto smaller businesses and maybe they can generate jobs. So instead of um, step back, I mean, Muhammad Yunus's genius, right, was to convince the world that that poor people have the capacity to be entrepreneurs, that the path out of poverty is self-employment. I think one of the questions which has always been alive in the microfinance conversation is maybe that's wrong. Maybe we need to revisit that. Maybe what re people really want is a steady job and they are you know, self-employed because that's the only option around. Mm -hmm. So one of the things early on that I was sort of looking at, which was part of this step to you know, our agreeing to do this, was a study that I did with Jonathan Boucher a few years back that was published in World Development, where we looked at that kind of question about different poverty alleviation methods, microcredit versus SMEs. We didn't do any RCTs. We just wanted to look at who's actually involved. And we were looking at BRAC, uh, women who were borrowing from BRAC, 91% were women. And they were poor, they were not educated, they were well targeted for interventions to try to reduce poverty. 
And then we looked at the employees of SMEs, of small businesses funded by BRAC Bank, so sort of different arm of BRAC in Bangladesh. And, you know, that would be the group that naturally you'd say, well, instead of, you know, making loans to um, small scale entrepreneurial women, make loans to these businesses who can employ family members. Um, but we saw that those employees were not typically family members. They tended to be from a different group of families. They were not particularly poor. They were somewhat better educated. They were tended to be male. They worked really hard, you know, 11 hours a day, six days a week. And so family duties weren't really part of what they could do. It was a really very different world. And so this question about, well, maybe SME, you know, finance is the way to reduce poverty instead of microfinance. I, I saw just, it was a lot more complicated. And that focus on poverty and small business hasn't really gotten enough attention. And that, I think that's one of the things we're trying to do um, with this work. The other thing, of course, is that this is a huge sector. So as an economist, it's hard to ignore. There is really exciting economic work that's going on by lots and lots of researchers around the world, a lot with RCTs. There are really exciting financial inclusion possibilities, some of it um, digital. And you know, at the same time, it's complicated, it's messy. Uh, small firms, we, you know, this is financial inclusion week. So we tend to come at small firms with a financial lens. But one of the things that's really interesting and and maybe different from microfinance, is that the binding constraints may actually be managerial. They may have to do with quality upgrades or being able to hire people of a certain skill. They may not ultimately be financial or may not be financial in the way that we've sort of come to assume. And the financial diaries are exactly the kind of study we sort of step back from assumptions, look, listen, watch, track, firms, exactly the kind of study that can help to sort of reconfigure the pieces. Hmm. So diaries, though, you know, part of the challenge of diaries is you get this flood of data. Um, you know, you have to have these cash flow data to really answer some of these core questions about the choices. But at the same time, it's really hard to think about what you do with cash flow data. Um, and making sure that you don't just, okay, here's some data. Um, you have been thinking about this for a long time, and I think you're you're thinking about what what we're looking for and how we interpret cash flow data has evolved some. So tell us about you know the frameworks that you use to think about cash flows and then how that translates into sort of what are the bigger questions that we care about rather than, well, this firm earned this much and spent this much. Yeah, it is hard. There's a lot of data. I mean, I think ultimately financial diaries and this kind of work in this project is less about like testing a hypothesis or, you know, an RCT will do that better. It's about trying to generate ideas or sort of expand the playing field of ideas. And in that sense, the data, analyzing the data is very much in conversation with thinking about theory. And often, you know, when we were doing previous financial diaries, we would often, you know, our inclination would be to say, oh, hey, look, they did this, this firm did this, or this household did this. But often it was more powerful to do something slightly different, which was to say, hey, the household did that, but why didn't they do this other thing? Theory tells us they could have done three things. Why did they choose that path? And then once you're asking that question, why, didn't something happen? Why didn't we see something? You're in a very different and more interesting theoretical terrain. So theory really is gonna matter a lot here and does matter a lot here. And the other part is there's so much data, we just need to organize it and connect all the pieces, the firm owner, the firm itself, the employees. And so you know, taking the lessons from corporate finance, from you know business accounting is really, really helpful. At some level, we think about the firms more like households. Sometimes we think about the households more like firms. That's the that's the framework we're using. So let me flip it back to you, Tim. Um, you spend a lot of time thinking about real world applications of our research and other people's research. Um, you've 
spent time trying to get people to focus on financial needs and financial products. So what are the, what are the needs that you're thinking about? How are you framing um, that part of this work? So a couple of years ago, I was doing some work for CDC, the uh, British government's um, private investment group, about you know how to better frame their choices you know, when they were making investments and you know what the development of financial services meant and how you know the history of financial services and who got served and not and you know that that led me to spend a lot of time thinking about what's a useful way of framing that conversation up and why it was so hard to see impact of financial products uh, and one of the things that, that came out of that that thinking was there's this difference between a product and a need and the products that we have one of the, the beauties of finance is that the same product can be used to meet lots of different needs and so it's tough sometimes to say what's the impact of a loan if you don't know what the problem what the need that the people person taking the loan is trying to meet is and so for instance microfinance was really framed as these are loans for productive investment. But you know, one of the things we've learned from diaries is that in fact, the constraint that the need that, that the household had was smoothing consumption, managing liquidity. And they weren't using the loans to invest because that wasn't the biggest problem they had. They were using the loans to smooth the ups and downs, the volatility they had. And so when you make a loan and then go look for the investment that came in a loan and you see nothing. Um, it doesn't mean the product necessarily was a failure. It means the product wasn't used for the thing that you measured for. So if we extend that further and thinking about what is then, what are the needs that, that households and small firms have? It, you know, for me, it boils down to there, there are three things. They sort of arrange in a pyramid. Like the most basic level is uh, households and firms need to manage liquidity. They need to manage liquidity because they live in a world that's unstable, that your incomes are not necessarily the same or match up exactly with your needs. And so you need ways to move relatively small sums from day to day, week to week, month to month over a relatively short time frame. And that's what I refer to as managing liquidity. So, you know, uh, a product you can use to do that is, you know, just a basic transaction account where you get money today and you spend it the next day. You don't have to do everything in cash. But it's also a savings account. You can also use a loan. So any of the products can be used uh, for that. You know, a loan for someone you know takes an amount of money and then allows you to uh, move around when you're paying it. So only once you can manage liquidity do you sort of move on to a more important or a, you know a, a, the next level of need. And you know that I think of as managing investment. So. Um, households and firms want to be able to invest to make something better in the future. Um, and that requires building up lumps at various points in time. So if you're going to make an investment, then you need to get enough money all at one point in time. And so that can be savings. That can be uh, transactions accounts that you just sort of turn into a savings account. It can be a loan. Uh, different products you can use to meet those needs. Before, though, you fully fulfill your uh, ability to manage investment, though, you also have to manage risk. And we know that risk is a factor in people making decisions about how they manage liquidity and how they manage uh, investment. And again, you can use transactions, accounts, loans, savings, insurance. You can use any of those products to meet a need to manage risk. But you have to have some way of responding to the ups and downs that are bigger, not just sort of day-to-day -day fluctuations, but big shocks. And that if you can't do any of the, if you can't do that, then it impedes your ability to manage investment. And so before we come back to thinking about what, what are the products uh, that are needed, we have to think about what are the needs that people have, and then think about, are there ways we can specifically design products that specifically meet those needs? But that leads us to another challenge, which is how do we identify the need exactly what the firms have. And you know, Jonathan, you have a relatively new paper that you know, tries to, you know, I have my framework of three, three needs. Um, you uh, have a relatively new paper with sort of another framework of three to think about, uh, I guess, more from a policy perspective, what is the problem that needs to be addressed? 
Yeah, you know, it's, in, it's interesting. Um, but before going there, I, just to get to what you're saying, right? It sounds like there's this hierarchy, like liquidity and investment. And in the background, there's there's risk. Um, one of the things which is so striking, which I'm excited about, you know, for this project is that the liquidity part, you know, what you started with, is really hard to see in annual data. You don't see it. You need this kind of high frequency data where you're going back to the firms, you're going back to the households, you know, every couple of weeks or so, just seeing these ups and downs um, at high frequency. And there's there's really no substitution for that. But we don't have a lot of that data, and it kind of skews how we then think about policy problems, economic problems. And the other part, which you know is interesting, and we're going to talk a little bit about it um, in a few minutes, is the risk part. It's not just like what tools, financial tools do you use, but to what extent can you push the risk onto other people? And one of the things I'm really curious about it with small firms is to what extent are firms pushing the risk onto their employees? You know, we'll come back to that, but you know, that in a, in a way is going to connect what we're seeing with small firms to what we were seeing with the household diaries. And it's it's a question that doesn't really get framed because people don't really have this kind of data. But you know, you you said Tim that I have a new framework for thinking about you know how these pieces come together. In a way, it's an old framework. It's just got some new words attached to it. Because the old framework came from Portfolios of the Poor, you know, the book um, that I co-authored uh, with Orlando Ruffin and Stuart Rutherford and Daryl Collins, um, where we described household challenges as a triple whammy. Not enough resources, volatility, and then a lack of reliable financial tools. And we can translate that into a different set of words that have been helpful in this context, which is number one, insufficiencies, number two, instability, and number three, illiquidity. So kind of three I's, insufficiency, instability, illiquidity, and they interact. Like I said, that's a fourth I. Uh, they interact, and that is, has been a really helpful way to look at the data. And, I'm really excited when you were putting together the um, slides for today, we have some slides, which I think we're gonna go to in a, just a moment, um, that try to pick up on those themes and explain them. Yeah, I mean, that's our jumping off point to go a little deeper. Um, and specifically on this, you know, now that we've established some of the some of the core thoughts and uh, Moses, who's one of the, the people watching in, asked the question about, uh, is the data we're gathering flawed? Um, it, it's incredibly challenging to gather this data in the first place. Uh, hard to know whether you're capturing everything because of you know one of our core questions is you know what is the boundary of the firm and how do you account for all of these different inputs and outputs? So the firm owner's household and uh, as you were talking about the pushing risk onto the employees. How do you account for that? Or when the firm owner uh, pulls money out of the firm because of a household shock and then puts money back into the firm from a relative. Is that a loan? Is that an investment? Is that equity? There's lots of challenges. So I, I put up a slide just here, just from some of our, you know, the first country we started diaries in Ethiopia. Um, uh, we've got about six months of data uh, now gathered. Um, and I do want to take a moment to acknowledge um, we are not operating in the places in Ethiopia where there is active conflict, but um, the situation in Ethiopia has gotten uh, pretty scary. Um, and acknowledge that uh, you know, we are doing everything we can to ensure the safety of our staff and of the firms that we're working with. But we do have some firms uh, who were the firm owners are ethnic Tigrayans who have had their firms shut down forcibly uh, as a consequence of the uh, the civil conflict there. And um, it is something that we're watching closely and very concerned about. But as we look at some of this data, it sort of shows how hard it is to, to understand, like, what does it mean when you look at this data? And are we even getting it right? So in this chart, you just see the, um, the range, the weekly median in the range, which is one way to think about firms on a weekly basis. Another way is to say, well, part of the point of firms is to transform away from weekly to, to sort of larger time scale. So the orange there is if you combine cash flows uh, bi-weekly. 
And then you look at compare that to a, a, a weekly average and where those sits. And it can be a little hard to, to see. And you can see there's a, a big diversity just between these uh, 10 or so firms that we're using here as an example. And so we started thinking about, so what's a better framework for us to start thinking about illiquidity and insufficiency and instability and the needs uh, that ultimately yield products for these firms? Uh, are they having a problem managing liquidity? Are they having a problem managing investment? And so I put together some quick hypotheticals here as to you know, what would a uh, firm that was experiencing insufficiency, meaning there just there's is not enough money there. So here's uh, uh, these next few slides for everybody are hypothetical, and then we'll, we'll actually see uh, some examples looking at real firms based on this. But thought it's easier to think about if we we simplify it with some hypotheticals. So you know here's a revenue line for this firm. You can see it's volatile, but it's it's positive. But of course, we care more about revenue. There's also the question of expenses. Um, and you see sort of the expenses also bouncing up and down. You convert that into starting to look at net cash flows. So how do revenues match with expenses? You can see some weeks it's positive, some weeks it's negative. But for this hypothetical firm, when we look at a cumulative net cash flow, you can see it's consistency, consistently negative. This is a firm that is not earning enough, not only to grow, but to survive for very long. You know, we look at this and we know at some place there are some resources this firm is drawing from. But the product and policy implication of looking at a firm like this is this is not a firm that you're going to make a loan to and put them on a trajectory where they're uh, hiring employees and growing. There's a core insufficiency problem here that needs to be focused on. Do they not have access to the markets that they need, whether inputs or outputs? Do they not have just the core managerial skills? to even recognize this pattern to be able to adjust to it. Yeah, this is interesting. I mean, you know, it's a great example of it not being all about capital necessarily. And it's also a nice example of a situation where they look really liquidity constrained. If you just look at the revenues and expenses, they're kind of moving together, which suggests they're liquidity constrained. They don't have a lot of leeway. But once you dig a little deeper, you can see there it's not just liquidity constrained. There's just fundamentally not enough revenue that's being generated relative to cost. So that gives sort of the, to think about what would a, a true liquidity constrained firm look like? So this is the most simple example, right? This is a liquidity constrained firms. Their expenses are um, very clearly driven by their revenues. They're just moving up and down in concert. This is the kind of firm that is spending based on what it's earning. And it's a profitable firm. You can see Revenues are always above expenses, but there is a, a ceiling very much so to where this firm can go. Um, this is not, again, a, a firm that necessarily uh, connotes uh, ability to borrow at a significant amount and certainly not one that con connotes a, a large ability to, um, to grow. So one of the uh, our other viewers sort of talked about sort of segmenting firms too, whether we were doing that in our selection about necessity entrepreneurs, which is a phrase that's been uh, used in a lot of other places versus uh, or, or, or reluctant sometimes has been used in that versus, you know, growth entrepreneurs. This is a firm that looks kind of necessity in the sense that this is a firm that's meeting the needs of the owner, but not on an upward trajectory. So do you have a product here that would help this kind of firm? So when I think about the possibilities here, right, this is the kind of firm that the idea of the line of credit uh, was developed for. So, um, you know, there's no guarantee that with a relieving the liquidity constraint that you could grow, but certainly there's suggestion here that this firm is well managed enough that you, know, you have to actually be paying attention to match this well. So that suggests that you've got an owner that really understands their cash flows. And if they were able to say, buy additional inputs or fund additional employees without having to worry about what their revenues were that week, that that's the kind of thing that might uh, project them on an upward trajectory. At the same time, though, this is not necessarily a firm that you want to give a large lump sum investment loan to um, until you see that this, this firm actually wants to grow. Uh, you know, here we don't see, we can't really tell the difference between uh, someone who wants to grow but doesn't have access to the capital to do it, and someone who's happy sort of existing at this level. 
and a you know a large loan for someone who doesn't have aspirations to grow uh, may actually be worse for them. So then looking at uh, a non-liquidity constrained firm, what would that look like? Uh, skip ahead too much. So you know this is again a fairly simple example to understand. So this is a firm where there's not a strong correlation between the expenses and the revenues. They're able to spend in weeks even when revenues are down um, and able to sort of cushion those shocks without much impact on you know their operations. They're staying within this uh, range of, 200 to 500 dollars uh, of income and expenses per week. So um, this looks like a firm that has an ability to manage liquidity. Yeah, I mean this is a bit of a weird graph. So I think the key thing to take away isn't that it's going to look exactly like this, but more that you can you can invest even when you don't have the revenue then. Right? You can spend. And that's that's really the key. You aren't bound by whatever you earned this week or this month. And maybe it'll look like this, but maybe it'll look pretty different. The key element is finance isn't all determining for the firm. Yeah. But it also sort of illustrates that we can't just sort of look at revenues and expenses in isolation and see, oh, they're not that correlated. Because if you look at this, uh, it's pretty hard to tell whether this is actually a profitable firm or not. Um, and that's part of our, uh, you know, what we'll look at is some of these hypotheticals. So you know, let's take the example of a firm that appears to be investment constrained. So here's the revenue line. Here's the expense line. And again, similar to this last chart, this firm might be profitable. It might not be profitable. So we look at their net cash flows on a weekly basis, and you can see sometimes it's above the line, sometimes it's below the line. But if we look at the cumulative net cash flows, so that's adding up all of their sort of weekly difference between revenues and expenses over time, you see, in fact, that this is a firm that is consistently uh, earning a margin. But it's not a firm where those cumulative net cash flows are going up. So, you know, this to me then looks like a firm that is well managed, is consistently reasonably profitable, has a margin, can cushion some shocks, can doesn't have a liquidity constraint necessarily because of their cumulative net cash flow. But that cumulative net cash flow is never reaching the amount necessary for them to make the investment to purchase an asset that's going to change where they are in this range. So this is a firm that may have aspirations to grow, but doesn't have the margin, doesn't have the ability to accumulate a lump necessary to buy a machine, to add another location, to uh, hire a truck to sort of expand their markets to go further afield for inputs and, and maybe change the profitability. So we're looking at a, a business loan here, for example. They could be a candidate there. Yeah, I mean, this you certainly know. looks like a firm that could afford an asset loan. Um, and you know, one of the things that I, I think is really interesting in the, the current microfinance uh, writ large impact literature is people paying a little bit more attention to uh, alternative ways of doing collateral-based lending. Uh, so uh, um, uh, Ted Miguel and, and some co-authors have done some work on that in Kenya. Uh, Mohamed Meki and some co-authors have been doing some work on that in South Asia and in, in Kenya, looking at ways, is there a way to create a business model that would allow a firm that looks like this to make an investment and change their trajectory? You know, what's striking to me here is, um, is one, you really have to be in the weeds with the firms in order to understand. I mean, the, those blue lines, these orange lines, they all kind of look similar in each of these graphs, but you really have to step back and see what's happening week to week and how things are accumulating or not accumulating to then be able to get a bigger picture. This is the this is sort of the art or the exciting part of the, the diaries is digging deep, but then stepping back and telling a kind of clearer, simple story. Mm. But there's a lot of time in the weeds just trying to understand firms. I wonder, you yeah. had referenced earlier these questions about shocks and who's bearing risks. And so I drew up something that sort of looks like that. Like, what would that look like for a firm that is pushing risk onto employees? And, and what would that mean? Yeah, you know, Tim, this came out of the U.S. Financial Diaries where we saw firms again and again, you know, if there wasn't enough business they would send their employees home and not pay them. 
And there were a lot of examples like that in the US where it was the, you know, these households, these workers who really weren't in a good position to absorb the risk, but who are nevertheless, you know, shouldering a, a chunk of it. And this is hypothetical, but this is the kind of thing that we might see in our data and we're gonna be looking for payrolls, like wages are a big chunk of total costs. And if there's a revenue shock, usually firms cut their expenses, that often means cutting payrolls. And that means you know your workers are gonna be without a job or gonna be earning lower wages. This is the kind of thing we're looking for. So once we're looking at liquidity, which seems like a really technical financial concept, we can map that onto something which is very real and you know, greatly affects people's well-being and ability to get through life. And it's it's really here. Um, small firms are an important but kind of often overlooked part of understanding dynamics of poverty and inequality. So this is one example. This is where the, the workers themselves are shouldering some of the um, risk. And Tim, I think you have another slide which looks somewhat different. This would be where the firm itself says, okay, we're going to try to maintain, try to protect our workers, maintain those cash flows going to payroll, and the firm itself will take a hit. Maybe the, the firm owner won't take money out, or maybe they will um, uh, just not make other kinds of investments during the period in order to protect workers. So we're going to be looking there. Mm. So those were um, hypotheticals. And we thought it'd be useful to just lay them out to clarify how we're thinking about this and to generate a little bit of discussion. But we do have some time um, to look at some real data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the questions that's come up is, you know, how should we thinking about COVID and COVID impact here? And of course, that's a, that's a huge question for all research that's in the field right now. And you know, one of the things we're doing like I said, you know, with the, the diaries is we can ask people, we started in Ethiopia in uh, May of 2021, so well into the pandemic. Um, and so we don't observe the pandemic change, but we are asking firms a lot about what was your business like before the pandemic? How many employees did you have? Where are your revenues in relation to that? How has that changed your business? And so you know, we are asking questions about that. One of the things that we're consistently hearing we're asking those questions is that the supply chain disruptions are not just the first world problem. Um, yeah. And, you know, two, you know, specifically in Ethiopia, you've got the pandemic plus uh, the civil conflict um, and the potential for ethnic cleansing uh, in two different parts of the country. And that is affecting people. It's affecting their markets uh, and affecting their inputs and their access to all sorts of resources. Um, and so, you know, you know, starting with a specific example here, this is a, a carpentry business. And I do want to come in, but there was a, a question asked earlier too about like the kinds of firms that we looked at. And is it, we, we did look at some specific industries across the world. We were looking at some light manufacturing industries, some agro-processing industries, and some services industries. Now on the light manufacturing and, and the agro-processing firms, uh, we selected those two specifically because we were curious about firms where there should be fairly obvious opportunities for investment and growth. And growth specifically of productivity, because productivity growth is a big part of hiring new employees and raising wages. And so we narrowed in on some firms where it seems plausible that you buy a machine and you become instantly more productive. It's not a, uh, you have to learn a whole lot or there's a very long-term payoff. If you're a carpentry shop and you buy a table saw, you can do a lot more tomorrow than you could do today. On the services side, we were selecting those firms because we did want to see services are an important part of economies around the world, but women entrepreneurs tend to be more concentrated in those industries. And we wanted to make sure that we were able to capture the experience of women owners. And so we'll look uh, at some of that here. You know, this is, a, as I mentioned, a carpentry firm. And it looks an awful lot from the early data like this is an example of insufficiency. So you see the uh, expenses are fairly high and higher than revenue on a consistent basis. It's not completely unprofitable, um, but this does look like a firm that may have had a, a real hit to, uh, to revenue from uh, COVID-related disruptions or, or civil conflict-related disruptions. 
um, you know, the net cash flows are fairly low. Uh, the cumulative uh, uh, is, is below zero here. And that means that there is some ability to cushion these. You know, the firm wouldn't exist if there hadn't been the assets and the ability to, to process this. You also see that um, the wages as a percentage of expenses here, it makes sense. They're relatively low as a percentage of total expenses in a business like this where inputs matter a lot. Electricity for running machines, as well as just the raw materials of the lumber. And so one of the things we're going to be trying to follow here is we're, we're able to gather a year of data. Like how long is this net cash flow negative happening? How are they funding this right now? Where is the cushion coming from? And what does that mean for the possibility of like what what could you do to help a firm like this? Um, or, uh, you know, from a policy perspective, we also have to realistically think about uh, how much uh, is a policy intervention about helping this carpentry firm be absorbed into another firm that has the ability to push cash flows uh, above zero. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, we'll come back to this one. Skip ahead to uh, a woman entrepreneur in Addis Ababa who makes injera, the, the bread that is the common staple of Ethiopian food. Um, and you'll see on the right side tables um, the a little bit more detail, and we'll look at a chart in just a second. Uh, you know, but this is a woman. What she tells us the problems are is high taxes. So, you know, something in common that you'll hear with small business owners around the world is uh, you'll always hear complaints about taxes. Um, her ovens that she uses to manufacture injera are old and wearing out and frequently need maintenance. Uh, one of the, the really interesting things that she reported is she has taken to uh, standing over the shoulder of the maintenance workers, watching them repair her ovens in an attempt to teach herself what they're doing uh, so that she can do a little bit more maintenance herself. So she doesn't feel the confidence of sort of going to get training and maintenance, but she's trying to learn for herself how to maintain her ovens. Another big problems is intermittent electricity and that costs are, are rising significantly. And that's put a real liquidity constraint on her. Occasionally she's had to shut down her business because she just doesn't have the money for the inputs to, to uh, make it worthwhile to run the ovens. She does report that sometimes she's able to borrow uh, for inputs, um, but that she has very limited savings because um, she is uh, just, she's a net positive, but, but not very much. Um, all of her transactions are in cash. She doesn't use digital uh, financial services at all. And she does report that she would like to replace with better, more efficient ovens, but that she doesn't believe that she can get the loan necessary to do that. So if we look at her um, uh, right now, she's struggling quite a bit. Uh, her net cash flows are um, uh, occasionally above zero, but her cumulative is fairly low. Um, but a lot of that seems to be because of this, uh, this civil conflict disruption that she's experiencing. She also does seem to have access to some financing uh, off the books that is allowing her to borrow sometimes uh, but also to, to keep the business running um, while she's trying to figure out how to do maintenance and get be better access to resources and employees. You know, Tim, this is a really nice example of you know, what we started with, that you know, when we were thinking about microfinance, there was this idea that this really is a financial problem, that people are eager to invest, they've got energy, they've got ability, they just need the capital to unlock their potential. And here we see, you know, with this food business, um, you know, she's having a hard time getting the money that's part of it, but she also has a hard time, um, you know, being able to hire and keep staff. Seems that there's also some quality issues. The electricity is a big issue. So finance is part of it, but it's only one part of it. Um, and it's much clearer when you're talking about small firms that you've got these overlapping constraints relative to I think, the assumptions when we were talking about uh, microfinance. It also seems like you know, this is, uh, you know, there, there's been a, a lot invested in training. Um, and 
uh, David McKenzie from the World Bank, who's part of our uh, global advisory board, has sort of been leading the way and trying to better understand what's happening with training and what the impact of training is. Uh, and one of the things that seems to be emerging from his work is that a whole lot of training is just trying to do way too much. So it's sort of comprehensive small business training that is trying to teach people to keep better records, plus do marketing, plus manage employees, plus negotiate with suppliers, plus figure out how to formalize, plus how to work with a bank, plus, and each of those things are small enough that you don't really see much of an impact and that, that the entrepreneurs that are trained in that way don't stick with what the training is because you know, they've been told you there are 30 really important things to do and they do each of them a little bit for a little while, don't seem to see much impact and then quit doing all of them. Uh, you know, when I see a, a, a chart like this and the, you know, what this woman is reporting about, she doesn't think she can get a loan and uh, the maintenance costs are a real big issue. I think, well, what about the possibility of you know, training her specifically on maintaining the ovens, right? Is that the sort of thing that could push these net cash flows consistently above zero to you know, create the platform for her to then spend a little bit more time on some other things? that if she didn't have to spend on maintenance, it could do more of that maintenance herself, then that, that puts her on, a, on a, a consistently profitable level and frees her up to think about other things, to see other possibilities. At the same time, if you tried to take her away from her business to do the kind of comprehensive training that we often see, it's not clear that she'd be able to restart her business, that she'd be able to sacrifice that time away because of what does look like some, some pretty significant liquidity constraints here. Let's come back finally to uh, this firm, um, who is a, a repair shop owner. So more sort of in the services business. And you see, you know, particularly there, three employees and wages are a huge part of uh, their expenses. There's not a lot of input costs other than the employees. Um, but you see these sort of expense spikes um, that uh, are interesting that, you know, he is this firm owner is able to spend pretty substantial sums irrespective of where the revenues are looking. This doesn't seem like a liquidity constrained firm. It does raise some questions though about, you know, how would you help this firm get on a different trajectory? Is that just a question of being able to hire more employees? And again, as you were saying, Jonathan, that's one of those questions of, you know, to delve into after you see a chart like this, is the growth problem here really that to grow this firm, you just need more trained employees who can do the job. And if you don't have access to those employees, there is a ceiling on, on how big you can get. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, as you think about a firm like this, um, one of the things about the diaries is we can sort of dig deeper. And, you know, one of the questions is, is transportation an issue? It may not be because they're you know, choosing to operate locally, but maybe, you know, if they were able to invest in, say, buy a, a motorcycle, they could go much further more quickly and be more efficient. So, you know, one of the things about the diaries is like, taking these constraints apart and trying to see exactly where they, uh, where they land. That a firm may not think it's liquidity constrained because they're not even allowing themselves to imagine some of the investments they could be making if they had the capital. Hmm. I think that does bring us back to, and, and by the way, I'll, one final shout out for questions. We've gotten uh, a, a number of different questions that we tried to try to integrate in here about, you know, how we chose which firms we're, we're interviewing and uh, disruptions. I will say too, by the way, that uh, we do have a methodology around firms that close during the study so that we can keep following the owners and better understand what happens to the employees and the owners of firms that close. Uh, do those owners go on to become employees of other businesses or do they start other businesses? And what happens to their employees? Are they just moving from small firm to small firm? Or does that put a real, uh, uh, do, a, do a lot of damage to the household and set those households back when small firms close? Yeah. But if others are seeing anything in the charts in our discussion and want to throw those uh, into questions or comments, we would love to see those. Yeah, um, disagreements, comments, um, 
there were uh, some observation of things that people are seeing in their own similar work. Um, I, can I want to respond to one of the comments which came in from Dr. Malik, who asks, um, how do you develop the right methodology to check the impact? Which is a really you know, important question, especially as you know, the world is pushing for more and more evidence-based um, policies. I think it's, it's worth kind of reiterating that the diaries really are not well set up in this format to look at impacts. You know, we're really trying to understand descriptively how are firms making choices? Where are they hitting setbacks? Where are they seeing opportunities? What's allowing them to see those opportunities? What's keeping them from um, protecting themselves from those setbacks? And really it's a step toward building better interventions that we then would want to find the impact of. But I'll just have a, a sort of quick footnote since the question comes up. There are two kind of parts of the bigger project where we actually are trying to get it impacts. And they're both in Uganda and they're both with you know, a great set of um, research partners. One is taking up a really interesting question that we've been thinking about ever since we started diaries, which was, does the fact of doing diaries change the way that you respond and run your business or run your life? Okay, one of the things which is possible is that simply by engaging the, um, you know, the research team and describing what you're doing, you pay more attention to what you're doing and that could really change what you're doing fundamentally. And Tim, can you say a little bit more about that work? It's with Emma Riley, um, just yep. at the University of Washington. It's really exciting. Yeah, so in that work, we're working with relatively smaller women uh, business owners, and we have a, a treatment group and a control group, um, uh, expressed simply. The control group is being interviewed three times over the course of the study. The treatment group is being interviewed, uh, so one is being interviewed every two weeks, just interviewed. And then another group is being interviewed every two weeks and we're providing them a report based on the data that we gather on, you know, sort of the similar to the charts that we've been producing. Here are the revenues, here are your expenses, here's how you're doing overall. Uh, and so, you know, that we hope that that helps us answer if just asking people the question changes or also if, you know, there's this relatively simple intervention, if you're going to gather this data that you can provide some of this data back to them formatted in a way that's a little easier so that they don't have so much cognitive burden of doing all of the calculations themselves. If you can present some of that data to them fairly simply, does that really help them then understand their situation uh, and make better uh, management decisions? So kind of leaning into the information provision right. rather than leaving it implicit. Say, okay, let's just ramp this up. You know, the other RCT um, really briefly in our last minute is looking at a particular intervention that might help um, you know, the, the firms in Uganda, particularly carpenters. And here we're using financial diaries to try to diagnose uh, you know, the most salient constraints, the most um, possibly effective uh, interventions, and then design an intervention and then follow it up with more diaries, all doing it in a randomized control trial framework. And some of the things we're looking at there are focused on quality enhancements and quality certification to see how that interacts with these other issues like finance, uh, et cetera. Well, as you noted, Jonathan, we're just uh, coming up to the end of the hour. Uh, we hope very much that this conversation has been interesting and useful, but I wanna close out with uh, a couple of points. You know, we care very much about not just the frameworks that we use to think about these things and the academic insight that we generate, but how those translate into products and policies. And you know, we frequently get the question when we talk about this is, uh, what advice are you going to give the firms? And you know, I come at this from a perspective of, I think running one of these firms is incredibly difficult. I don't know ex ante what good advice is. And so part of the reason that we're doing this is so that we can understand well enough to, to understand what the needs are, both for the firms so we can help them, but also to develop better, better products and policies. But I also don't think we can do that all, all on our own. And so we are really, really uh, extremely interested in the perspectives of others who see this data um, to, to share with us what they're seeing and how they would apply some of these insights. 
Um, the reason we're doing this globally is because we think there is a lot of applicability and there are a lot of people who could use this data. And so um, you'll be able to follow the Small Firm Diaries on smallfirmdiaries.org. You can sign up for regular updates. And we're going to start producing here relatively shortly um, the uh, some of the outputs, just telling some of these firm stories um, that we're seeing. So uh, we would love for you to be following us and to provide input. And if you have things that you think are particularly interesting that we're not noticing, please do uh, be in touch around those things. Uh, we think we have a lot to learn about these small firms and that there's a lot of knowledge out there that, that uh, if, if better questions that we could be asking, better ways to looking at the data. So please do in touch. You, uh, you can do that via Twitter on Small Firm Diary at uh, smallfirmdiaries.org, uh, directly with financialaccess.org, uh, or reach out to Jonathan or I directly. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. And there were a couple of questions that we didn't have a chance to get to um, that we will respond to um, through the chat. Yep. So um, thank you all. Uh, we hope that Financial Inclusion Week is interesting and profitable for all of you. We'll be paying attention to a lot of the things coming up this week. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things happening out there, some really great sessions. So encourage you to stick around for the rest of Financial Inclusion Week uh, this, this week and attend some more of those sessions. And we'll look forward to seeing you virtually or in person at some point in the future. Thanks, everyone. See you, everybody.